The Gospel of Luke, chapters 17 and 18. At the beginning of chapter 17, the Lord addresses the subject of deliberately placing stumbling blocks in the path of immature believers to undermine their faith. Although all believers can be endangered in this way, little ones refers to those young in the faith. The judgment of those who make it their business to harm the confidence of the children of God is severe. Jesus then turns from dangers to responsibilities. In this case, the responsibility is to have a forgiving spirit. This is a central feature of Christianity, so we must spend time reflecting on this passage. When bad behaviour occurs, it needs to be pointed out in a direct way and resolved. If there is repentance, there should be forgiveness. Peter came to Jesus with a similar question in Matthew 18 verse 21. Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him, up to seven times? Jesus replied, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven, verse 22. The Saviour was not limiting our forgiveness to 490 times, but explaining that we should not be keeping count. To impress this on Peter, he tells him the parable of the unforgiving servant. The parable centres on a king who arranged to settle his accounts with his servants. During the process, he discovers one owed him 10,000 talents. A talent was the largest denomination of currency, so 10,000 talents was a staggering amount of debt, and the servant could not pay. And the judgment was for him to lose everything to offset the debt. The servant fell before the king, begging him for time to pay for everything he owed. The king was moved with compassion, released him from his debt and set him free. Now you would have expected that such an act of grace to be a life-changing experience. Instead, the servant found a fellow servant and with physical violence demanded the repayment of a hundred denera. This was a tiny sum compared with the immense debt the first servant had been forgiven. The debtor appealed for time to repay the debt but was imprisoned. This injustice caused fellow servants to tell their master what had happened, and the forgiven servant found himself in the presence of an angry king, judged for failing to show others the compassion he had received. The lesson is simple. A life in Christ began with experiencing the forgiveness of God. It filled us with love and joy. It warmed our hearts towards others and gave us the desire to share the wonder of the gospel. It brought us into the family of God and a fellowship of life and love. But sadly, it is still possible for us to become unforgiving. Paul has to write to the Ephesians, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamour, loud quarrelling, and evil speaking put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you, Ephesians 4, verse 31 to 32. Then in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, Paul also writes, Forgiving one another, if any has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection. In these two passages, we understand how bitterness takes root. Wrath is the strongest outward expression of the anger which begins in our hearts. Loud quarrelling and spreading bad reports about fellow Christians were also in evidence in one of the most blessed churches in the New Testament. All this demonstrates how far we can stray from being an expression of the power of God's forgiveness. Paul encouraged them and challenges us to judge such behaviour in ourselves, to replace bitterness with kindness wrath and anger with tender-heartedness and forgiveness, not superficial forgiveness, but the depth of forgiveness God shows us in Christ. The Colossian passage starts with our position in Christ, elect of God, holy and beloved. Paul encourages action, put on. He highlights features of the Saviour's character, tender mercy, kindness, humility, meekness and long-suffering. What God has shown to us, we are to show to others. Bearing with those we find difficult and testing, rejoicing in the grace of forgiveness. Forgiving someone does not mean we have not been hurt, felt belittled or suffered pain. It means bringing that hurt, humiliation and pain to the Saviour. He knows those feelings deeper 
than we ever could. At the cross we see the cost of our salvation and reap its blessings, and these begin with the first words of the crucified Saviour, Father forgive them, for they do not know what they do, Luke 23 verse 34. In returning to the place of our forgiveness, we discover our complaints can be left there, and we can be empowered by grace to forgive as Christ forgave us. And more than this, we learn above all these things to put on love which binds us together as brothers and sisters in Christ. It must have encouraged the Lord to hear his disciples ask, increase our faith. The Lord then encourages them by explaining how even small faith can have a powerful effect. The Lord uses extreme language to stimulate their faith. This is seen in the book of Acts by the remarkable things which took place through the apostles' faith. The Lord teaches us about service within the context of humility. We don't make a song and dance about what we do, we simply do what is asked in a spirit of humility and with thankful and joyous hearts, and we leave rewards for our service to the Saviour. Paul helps us on this subject in Colossians 3, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him, verse 17. And whatever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not to men. Verse 23. The story of the ten lepers is remarkable. The disease separated the sufferer from normal society, yet included in their number was someone who was a Samaritan. Suffering is a great leveller and brings acceptance where usually there would have been division. There was also faith. They cried, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. The Lord's response was to send them to the priest to certify that they were healed. But at that point, they were not healed, but believed and obeyed Christ's instruction. It was as they went to find the priest, they were cleansed. Nine carried on with one thought, to be pronounced clean and to return to the lives that they had lost. But their Samaritan friend stopped, returned to Jesus, and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at the feet of the Saviour and gave him thanks. Jesus asked, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? He recognised that the man who returned to express his gratitude was a foreigner. Verse 18. He blessed the man, but was saddened how even among some of his own people whom he healed, there were those who forgot to give him thanks. In the final part of chapter 17, the Pharisees asked Jesus when the kingdom of God would come. They were looking for a physical realm, but Jesus told them, the kingdom of God is within you. They expected the Messiah to appear, deliver the nation, and set up his kingdom on earth. The disciples asked Jesus a similar question in Acts 1, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Verse 6. There are two aspects to the kingdom of God. There is a present spiritual aspect to the kingdom of God, and the future aspect is referred to in Luke 19, verse 11, Luke 21, verse 31, and Luke 22, verses 16 to 18. These verses look forward to establishing Christ's kingdom on earth, when he will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. This was the kingdom the Pharisees had in mind. The most important thing is how we respond to the present aspect of the kingdom. The Saviour said, the kingdom of God is in your midst. So it had come. The Pharisees were blind to the kingdom, even though the king himself was in front of their eyes. They were rejecting their king. The Saviour's death at Calvary and subsequent resurrection and ascension into heaven provided the way into the kingdom of God. But the Pharisees didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God or their Messiah. They did not think the kingdom of God was in their midst. In verses 22 to 25, the Lord explains to his disciples the future aspect of the kingdom of God. Before it is set up, Christ describes a world that will deteriorate morally and spiritually. False claims will be made about Christ's coming, but the Lord tells us it will be quick, unexpected and glorious. But before that day, the Saviour would be rejected, suffer and die then after his resurrection returned into heaven. Christ's suffering has ended and his work of salvation is complete, but he is still rejected. 
In verses 26 to 32, the Lord uses two Old Testament examples to teach us about the character of days before the Son of Man appears. The first is Noah. No one was expecting God's judgment, so life went on as usual. It was the same in the days of Lot. Everyone ate, drank and did business. But the day Lot left, destruction came. The Lord was teaching his hearers that the coming of the kingdom of God would be characterised first by judgment. The final verses describe a time of separating the good from the wicked. It was a warning to be prepared. Before this happens, Christians will have been taken to be with the Lord into heaven, and things on earth will go on as usual until the Lord comes to set up his kingdom and judge the world. The parable of the persistent widow teaches us about commitment in prayer. The widow did not give up or lose heart, but continued to appeal to an uncaring judge. The judge became wearied by her appeals and gave her justice. The Lord used this as example to make us realise that God welcomes our appeals and that we should never cease to have faith no matter how testing the circumstances. As well as a present encouragement to be persistent in prayer, the parable references a future day before the Lord's coming when such faith will be rare. In the following parable, the Lord deals with those who trusted in their own self-righteousness and despised others. He uses the example of two men praying in the temple. One was a Pharisee who thanked God he was better than other men and boasted of what he did. He disdained the second man who was a tax collector. He stood afar off, head bowed, beating his breast, and with a fervent prayer cried, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Lord tells us this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The Lord's words remind us of the words of Isaiah, who wrote about the heart of God, for thus says the High and Lofty One, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, with him who has a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Isaiah 57 verse 15. Luke then records when mothers brought infants to Jesus to be blessed. The irritated disciples turned them away, but Jesus called them back to bless them. Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. He uses the children to illustrate the need of those who would receive the kingdom of God to have a childlike faith. A ruler came to Jesus with an important question. Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus immediately challenged him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. And then reminded him of the commandments. The ruler ignored the Lord's question, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. He only addressed keeping the law and said, All these things I have kept from my youth. So when Jesus said to him, You still lack one thing, Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. He became very sorrowful, but he was wealthy. He never looked at Jesus and said, I believe you are the Son of God, the Saviour of the world, the Saviour I need. There was one idol in his heart, and he could not free himself from it, nor did he ask to be freed. Instead, he walked away from the Son of God to keep his riches which he could never take out of this world. Jesus saw he was sorry and said, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Onlookers asked him, Who then can be saved? Material possessions were as deeply rooted in the people's hearts as they are now. But Jesus explains, God can free us from whatever holds us in slavery. Peter exclaimed, See, we have left all and followed you. It was a sad indication of his growing self-confidence. And Jesus reminds him, No one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more in this present time 
and in the age to come eternal life. God is no man's debtor. Against this background of materialism and pride, Jesus again tells his disciples for the third time that he was going to Jerusalem to accomplish the work of salvation. It would be a pathway of untold suffering and glorious resurrection. But his disciples still did not understand. They would only realize the wonder of his suffering death when they saw their resurrected Lord. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man sitting by the roadside heard the crowd passing by and asked what was happening. They told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. He did not need to be told twice and immediately started crying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. When the people told him to be quiet, he ignored them and shouted even louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still, commanded the man to be brought to him, and asked, What do you want me to do for you? His reply is beautiful, Lord, that I may receive my sight. He recognized Jesus as his Lord, and believed he could give him his sight. The person who brought the world into being honored the man's faith and gave him his sight. He never went back to the place he begged. He followed Jesus and led the crowd in glorifying praise to God. The rich ruler went home poor. The poor blind beggar followed Jesus. No one could be richer.